Hello, today we're going to discuss rotational and angular kinematics. As a review, because we're now looking at circular motion again, let's talk about uniform circular motion. Remember that when we had objects that were traveling with uniform circular motion, they were going in a circular path but at a constant speed. Okay, So the speed was constant, but the direction was constantly changing. Okay, So if you're going in a circular path, that's a constant change of direction, therefore the object is accelerating. Okay, So we're experiencing acceleration and a force that we call the centripetal force, the centripetal acceleration. Okay, Our centripetal acceleration equation is V squared over R, and our centripetal force equation is just that ma the mass times the centripetal acceleration, or MV squared over R. Okay, as the object travels around, that V we're talking about is the linear or tangential speed, which would go off here in a straight line, and the acceleration is always toward the center, okay, because as the object travels around, its direction is continually changing. And if we're over here, again now, our acceleration is still toward the center because we're now changing direction as we go along. Okay, so the velocity and acceleration are always perpendicular to each other for an object that is going, experiencing uniform circular motion. Okay. Also don't forget that when the object is experiencing uniform circular motion, we can use our speed equation where V is distance over time. And we know the distance that an object travels one time around is the circumference or 2 pi r. And the time it takes to go around one time is defined as the period, capital T. Okay. So don't forget you can still use that equation if we're looking at uniform circular motion where the object's speed stays the same but its direction is constantly changing. Let's look at displacement now in terms of an angular value. Okay, and this may be a little bit of a review for you for math. So let's look, see what we have here. Okay, so if we, this is a circle, and that is the radius of our circle. And this is the arc length of our circle, okay, which we're going to call S. I don't know why they call that in math, but they call that S. We can determine what this angle here is, theta, by dividing the arc length by the radius. Okay, so we can say theta is equal to s over r. Okay. All semester long, though, we haven't been using s for a linear distance. We've been using delta x. So instead of saying s, we can say delta x. And we can say theta is equal to delta x over r. Okay. So if we take the straight line distance around the circle, divide it by the radius, that gives us an angle value. The unit that this is measured in is a radian, okay? And radians are going to be very important. We're going to do a lot of conversion from linear to angular variables, and to make sure that your angular variable is always in a radian for this to happen. So let's do a quick unit check here. Delta x we know we've been measuring in meters all semester long. The radius is also going to be measured in meters. So if you notice, the meters cancel each other out, okay? So you would think that there's nothing left. However, because we're dealing with a special ratio, we're left with a radian instead. Okay, so delta x, the arc length, whatever you want to think of it as, divided by the radius will give us the length in radians. Okay, we could also measure angular displacement in terms of revolutions. Okay, and a revolution is one time around the circle, a rotation, also one time around. Generally, a revolution is you know like the Earth revolves around the sun where we have an object moving around something else. We could say a singular point maybe on the circle is rotating around, or revolving around, but the whole object itself rotates. Okay, that's one thing to keep in mind. You can also measure in terms of degrees. Okay, so degrees would be another unit. Okay, and just remember that 360 degrees is equal to two pi radians. Okay, so just keep that in mind if you ever have to deal with degrees. So lots of different things we can think about in terms of displacement and the units we have. So remember, one time around, one revolution or one rotation is equal to 360 degrees, which is equal to 2 pi radians. Okay, angular speed, of course we look at displacement first, now we're looking at angular speed. And that is the rate at which an object rotates. So let's say this is a rigid object and it's rotating about. Okay, we want to think of this in terms of, now not its linear displacement, but it's angular displacement. Okay, so let's say it goes here, let's say it goes maybe to this point right here. Okay, and we want to know what is the angular speed during that time. Well, 
When we had linear speeds, we just divided the distance by the time. The angular speed, we're going to be dividing the angular displacement, our delta theta, by time. Okay? For measuring delta theta in terms of radians, degrees, rotations, revolutions, then T is some time unit, of course, that we've been dealing with. So lots of different units here you can see. You could have radians per second. You have revolutions per minute. Okay, and remember that revolutions per minute is abbreviated as RPM. Okay, so lots of different rate uh, measurements here for our units. If you want to relate this back to our linear variable, remember that delta theta was delta x over r. So now we have delta x over r over t. And think back to what delta x over t was, and that was v. Okay, so another relationship we have is that omega, this is what we call here, omega, angular speed, is equal to v over r. Okay? Another expression we have for omega is going to be back to our uh, one we use for uniform circular motion. Okay? If we know that omega is equal to delta theta over t, and one time around a circle is 2 pi radians, and we know the time it takes to go around the circle is the period, we could say 2 pi over the period is equal to our angular speed. Okay, so another relationship that you could have there. All right, so if something is rotating, it has an angular speed, and you can think of maybe an individual point as well as having some angular speed around a circle. All right, the last thing we're looking at is angular acceleration. We said that all objects traveling in a circular path experience a centripetal acceleration. So if we had like a point, if you know, something was hanging on the side of this, um, it would have some angular, some centripetal acceleration, you know, a car going around a track. But we could also say that if that car were speeding up or slowing down, it has some angular acceleration relative to the center of the object as well. Okay? So as it goes around, if the object is speeding up or slowing down, we know its angular speed is changing. So let's just say it has some angular speed here initially. Over here, it has some final angular speed at some later date we know that the difference in those speeds divided by the time it takes would give us our angular acceleration. The Greek letter we use for that is alpha, and that's equal to delta omega, the change in the angular speed, divided by the time. Okay, So our units for this are going to be radians per second squared is probably the most common one you're going to see. Okay, But it could be any of those other ones over the time uh, unit squared. Omega we know was... Uh, theta over t, okay, um, or well, let's just go back to say it was delta, um, delta v over r, okay, over this case over t, and so if we look at that, you know, again, we're looking at constant acceleration, delta v over t is going to be a, and so we have an expression here that this is a over r, and I'm going to put a little t here to help keep the difference between centripetal and tangential acceleration. Okay, tangential acceleration is the rate at which the linear speed changes. So the acceleration we've been dealing with all semester, except for centripetal, is called tangential acceleration. Okay? So if objects are speeding up or slowing down and traveling in a circular path, they're experiencing both tangential acceleration and centripetal acceleration. Okay? So if we have an object, let's just say we have a car going around a circular path. Okay, so this car is going in a circle. It's speeding up, so it has a tangential acceleration. And it's traveling in a circular path, so it has a centripetal acceleration. How would we determine the overall acceleration? Well, what do you notice about the tangential and the centripetal accelerations? Exactly, they're right angles to each other. Okay, we know that accelerations are vector quantities. How do we add vectors that are at right angles to one another? That's right, the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, So our overall acceleration that the object would experience would be somewhere along this line here. Okay, We can call that the net acceleration or the total acceleration. And it would be the vector sum of the centripetal and the tangential. Okay, So that's if we have an object traveling in a circular path who's speeding up or slowing down. We look at that net acceleration. Okay, Let's just write a brief e equation over here. So that A would equal the square root of the centripetal acceleration squared plus the tangential acceleration squared. Just as a reminder that we are doing vector addition here. Okay?
Last thing we're looking at is going to be our constant angular acceleration equations. You know, in the past we had our big four constant linear equations. So let's make a column for linear. And let's make a column for angular. And let's write out our equations that go along with it. So the first one we talked about a million years ago, Vf equals V naught plus AT. Okay. If I divide everything in this equation by R, okay, I have Vf over R, which is omega F. I have V naught over R, which is omega naught. I have A over R, which is alpha. And then T, of course, doesn't deal with that. So our first angular acceleration, our constant angular acceleration equation is omega F equals omega naught plus alpha T. Our second one, delta X equals one half V naught plus Vf times t. If I divide everything in that equation by r, I get delta theta is equal to one half omega naught plus omega f times t. Our third equation, delta x equals v naught t plus one half at squared. If I divide everything by r, I get delta theta equals omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Okay, So we're just changing our linear variables into angular variables. Super simple. The last one we got to divide everything by r squared because each of these has a term, either a squared term or two terms that have uh, linear variables in them. So if we divide everything by r squared we get omega f squared equals omega naught squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. Okay, the biggest issue with this unit is going to be keeping your accelerations constant or keeping your accelerations clear and making sure you're just comfortable with the variables. Besides that, it's going to be a lot of things with which you're familiar. Should be very successful in this. We just got to make sure that we're paying attention, working on our problems, and doing being good problem solvers as we go along. Thanks.